We're going to be opening up for questions towards the end, but um, the main um, the main speaker who was supposed to give this component of today's presentation couldn't be here with us, unfortunately, today. So um, I'm going to try my best to fill some pretty big shoes and uh, do justice to the idea that was and will be hopefully conveyed uh, with competence and and, <laughs> and inspiration. Um, I'm going to be deriving some of what I'm going to be going through from uh, the work that was conducted by Jason Ross, um, both in the, his refutation of the debt trap uh, myth that's been imposed on the idea that this is what China is doing, as well as some of the work that he and some of his collaborators have done on the World Land Bridge, uh, which we'll make available to everybody here by email. The idea of ending with the, with the concept of, of a symphony of nations and that political uh, economy and the idea of international law should better be understood as a symphony where all parts, both the individuals as well as the nations that make up the brotherhood of mankind should be likened to a symphony where each part has their own voice, every person has their own voice, but they all have to find a way to play to a, a greater harmony than themselves for the good of all. This idea is, is not a new idea, it's not a Chinese idea. Uh, this goes back as a concept to the ancient, the ancient times. We've seen this uh, written about in, by Plato, by the Pythagoreans. We've seen this come up again during the European Renaissance. And in fact, ironically, some of the greatest leaders of the American system, going back to the leading economists of Abraham Lincoln, have spoken in depth and written in depth about this idea of a harmony of nations. Henry C. Carey, uh, somebody who... Um, I've studied quite a bit and, and was a leading advisor to Abraham Lincoln himself, wrote a book, his, his most famous book, called A Harmony of Nations, as well as Unity of Law, the Unification of uh, Economic, Political, and Moral Sciences. People like Sun Yat-sen, the, the, the founding father of the Republic of China, who led the, the 1911 revolution, was an ardent student of Abraham Lincoln's philosophy and wrote also very much about the idea of a harmony of nations. And he didn't just write it in a theoretical sense, neither did Henry C. Carey. These people were actually advocating for international rail development, the exportation of the means by which the United States went from a backwater agricultural uh, nation that produced nothing manufacturing-wise to become a leading country that even outpaced the industrial zones of Europe in the production of steel, uh, finished products, machine tools. It wasn't something that they wanted to keep for themselves, but the idea of national credit, a national bank that directed credit for long-term infrastructure, capital projects, this was something which defined America as separate from the European and other countries of the world. The idea of having a, a, a protective tariff to allow for the favorable growth of your local industries to compete with the dumping of cheap goods from abroad, usually manipulated by the British East India Company, was also one of the key features of what America uh, did to make itself an industrial powerhouse. But it didn't want to keep it for itself. And throughout the 19th century, the, po the policy of leading uh, Lincoln Republicans was to send this abroad. And it was employed in the Customs Union of Germany, the Zollverein, of uh, the development of the Trans-Siberian Rail by American system followers around Tsar Alexander II, who was also assassinated uh, by the same networks who killed Lincoln. It was deployed by the, during the Meiji Restoration, uh, where gunboats were being deployed by, by Britain to help uh, <laughs> turn Japan into empire. You had American system um, leaders in Japan working to unpack rail cars made in Philadelphia for the, to help Japan actually industrialize. You had this abroad. I mean, there's, there's cases in South America where Lincoln's policy was employed to great effect and to the detriment of the empire. And the only empire at the time that was recognized, it's a little bit more confused today, was the British Empire. And the, this is something which Sun Yat-sen studied when he wanted China to also leap into the 20th century by employing the best of the traditions of what America had represented and, and recognized that America had been also infested by uh, an imperial bipolarism, that there was something that wasn't expelled during the American Revolution that stayed within America um, working against its own interests that set up things like Wall Street. People like Aaron Burr, who killed Alexander Hamilton, was the founder of the Bank of Manhattan. That was the basis for modern Wall Street. So we, we hear a lot about the deep state and people think of it as American. It's not. When you get down to it, the deep state as we know it 
is the embedded structure of the British Empire within America that didn't leave after the revolution. And it's something which has really uh, been at odds with the best leaders of America, like Lincoln, like John F. Kennedy, like Roosevelt, and like the many others uh, who this thing took over walking over their dead bodies. Eight American leaders died while in office, right? People forget that. What were they doing? <laughs> and one, would be, one shouldn't be surprised to find out that these eight leaders who died while in office, plus Alexander Hamilton, were all doing the same thing. And all had the same view that America had a relationship and a responsibility to the poor countries of the world. So all that to say, what is China doing now? It's not anti-American. It's not anti-West. The idea of a symphony of nations is something which is universal. It's something tied to the best of what classical music and classical culture represents. Um, to get a better feel for that, I mean, I'm going to just look at a few statistics that I think are fun. Um, here's one thing. Right now, China has just begun to outpace the US in foreign direct investments into Africa. They've been very similar in terms of, if you look at the sheer quantity of numbers of money uh, that Africa has invested, uh, China has invested in Africa versus uh, the United States. But if you look at the breakdown of where that money is going, you get a sense of the two opposing paradigms, two opposing intentions. On the right, you see the FDIs by the United States as of 2015. Um, on the left, you have China. Anybody see anything uh, that stands out that might give us, an, give us an indication of who really wants to keep or what type of investments actually have a better future for Africa, and which, ty which types keep Africa in, in a sort of fixed place of exploitation? <laughs> Not a trick question. Mining. Yeah. If you only care about mining, and keep in mind, this isn't even like mining companies in Africa that are, that are African. You know, the, the money being invested in Africa for mining are being conducted by Western uh, mining cartels. It's not even really benefiting the African countries. I mean, you look, where you look where Barrick Gold or Shell Dutch Oil or other uh, mineral and, and oil companies do business in Africa, yeah, there's, there's billions of dollars being made by extraction and exportation to the foreign markets, but are the people who live in these zones like Nigeria, are they, are they actually benefiting? No, there's no infrastructure. These people are living in squalor. And you have a very little percent in, from on the right side that are tied to manufacturing, maybe 7%, uh, services here and there, holding companies. Versus China, you see a different spread. Obviously, they need mining. They need, China needs resources. Nothing is charity. But charity is not a good thing either. You know? If you just give somebody fish and you don't, feed them to, to, you don't teach them how to fish, that's not a good thing. So no, just giving them money is not necessarily a good thing. But it's not just mining, because China is also building up double in manufacturing, the ability, actually exporting the means by which the Africans uh, develop the capacities for factory and producing for themselves is very important. Yes, there's also the ability to have financial services. That's not even there in the United States uh, case. Why not? Why shouldn't there be financial services in Africa? Why shouldn't African countries have some controls over uh, the means of financing? Construction, infrastructure, 27%. Science and tech, that doesn't even show up in the US case or the European case of the IMF. Um, the idea of infrastructure is the key, though. This is very, very, very important, because that really is what defines the Belt and Road. And, it's, and the fact that infrastructure is driven by a commitment to scientific progress, the value of the human mind as something which drives innovation, that drives the increase of mankind's ability to sustain more life at a higher quality. This is vital. Um, the opposing view, if you look at the, the, um, the Western view, I, I, I was struck by a, a quote from 2013 by Barack Obama who exemplified this uh, Western, I'd say very, very condescending mentality towards Africa where he actually had the gall to go to a variety of African countries and give a speech in one of them. I believe it was Kenya, but it might have been somewhere in South Africa, I might be wrong, where he said, Ultimately, if you think about it, all the youth that everybody has mentioned here in Africa, it, if everybody is, is raising living standards to the point where everybody has got a car and everybody has got air conditioning and everybody has got a big house, well, the planet will boil over. So we can't have that. <laughs> God forbid. So what did, what did he announce? That 
the only type of investments, the, the, all of, of all of the billions of dollars that the U.S. was going to be giving to Africa, it was only allowed to go to clean, acceptable forms of energy that wouldn't boil the planet over. So massive subsidies to solar panels, uh, windmills. These things were acceptable. Things like dirty fossil fuels, nuclear power, unacceptable. They change the culture of Africa. They change the natural ecosystems of the African culture that are naturally tribal. We all know that. They're, they're, they don't, technology and, and these things, that's West. That's Western things. We don't want to impose our cultural values of technology onto, onto a country who, or into a civilization who's naturally, uh, you know, they, they naturally want to walk 12 miles a day for water from a dirty well. That's naturally what they want to do. So these things were acceptable. This way of thinking has been going on for a long time. This is not an Obama thing either. He didn't invent that. He was a symptom of the problem. This has been going on for decades before that. And Lyndon LaRouche, who's an, a recently deceased American economist, uh, the founder of the, Sh the Schiller Institute with his wife Helga, who I, I cited at the beginning, um, I he put together a very, very useful illustration to sim simplify but to get across in the most truthful way what exactly happened to the third world as well as to the West. Now, this triple curve, as he called it when it was developed in the 1960s, uh, sorry, it was developed in the 60s, but it came out as a triple curve model in, in 1996, demonstrates what happened to the West, because we've done this to ourselves too, um, where our infrastructure, the thing that, that actually has real value, representing the third, the blue physical economy from 1968, um, has been permitted to decay consistently. If you think about the where, where have all of the nation-building projects, the mega pro infrastructure, the maintenance, the, the, you know, the Montreal Railways were built, large, built largely in the 60s and early 70s. We haven't really continued a, pro a program of real serious nation-building since the 60s. That's been permitted to not only decay, but in its place, people have been given the idea that economics is about making money. And what better way to make money but with more money, especially if you can introduce principles of Las Vegas into the legitimate economy. Which, if you think about it, this is exactly what Wall Street has become, Bay Street has become. So you, the idea of ter creating greater forms of debt that you could then speculate on, whether it's personal debt, consumer debt, student debt, housing debt, national debts, foreign debts, these things, there's so many ways that people have been trained over the years to securitize and then speculate on non-existent entities and then create insurance on those. Is wild to the point that we now have over 700 to 800 trillion dollars of derivatives that don't mean anything, which are about 20 times more than the real economy. The real economy is the thing that is productive, right? When you turn on your water, that stuff that comes out, there's a whole network of infrastructure. The ability to have food in your grocery stores is tied to the physical economy, right? Healthcare, education, the fact that we have literacy, culture, these are physical, they're tied to the physical economy. Without these things, you don't have a life worth living. That's what people don't study anymore, and that's what China is studying. That's what China has realized is the core of what drives value and everything else, and money only has value to the extent that it sustains an ever-growing quality and quantity of the blue curve. That's, where we're, that's the transition that we have to get back to. So when people like Barack Obama ta start talking about how Africa can't have, it's not natural for them to have these things or else the planet will boil over, it's absurd. And it's as if like, the US has really done that great of a job, or Europe has done that great of a job in, in offering lending to countries. When you look at the effect of trillions of dollars over 70 years of, of lending to poor countries, we saw that it hollowed out you know, what happened to the, third, or the first world. But if you look at it, you know, where's the electricity for Africa, or most of South America? Or where's the development in Canada? What about most of Asia or Russia, right? Look at Australia. There's hardly anything there. So there's really been a complete demonstration of incompetence on how do you actually develop a growing, uh, an actual economy that sustains life. Now let's look at a few examples of some, uh, some things here. If we actually get down to it, China. OK. So of these investments, currently just a quick thumbnail sketch. When China says they're going to export their, their model to the, uh, the poor countries of the world, what does that mean? Are they just homogenizing the poor countries? 
Well, no. What this means is that in 1978, 90% of China lived below the poverty line. China was a third world country. Today, less than 1% of China lives below the poverty line. 99 million people were below the poverty line in 2012. Just to give a sense of the rate of, imp- uh, of progress here, 99 million people in China were below the poverty line in 2012. Today, 17 million, actually a little bit less. 70% of the UN Millennium Development Goals to end poverty have been met because directly of China. Right. Um, in Africa, over 230 infrastructure projects building and upgrading have occurred through China's direct leadership and investment. 30,000 kilometers of highways, 20,000 kilometers of railways, 85 tons per year of port throughput, 9 million tons per day of clean water treatment, 20,000 megawatts of power generating capacity, 30,000 kilometers of transmission and transformation lines. Compared to what that we've done, that Canada and the US and Europe have done for Africa in that same period, is there anything analogous? And you're going to find very similar approaches being made to the Caribbeans, to South America as well. <clears throat> the biggest water project in the world is something I just want to quickly brush over here. But um, just last year, you had, uh, well, look, there's a major crisis. If you guys remember the map that Christine showed at the very end of her, her presentation, had a, a picture of Africa as it is today versus 2063, with the idea that, this, that the African development goals of Africa 2063 are going to feature a very different world, right, with a connected, electrified, Africa, but there was also a big, big lake somewhere near the middle. That's something that, when I first saw that, I was a bit confused. What is that? Well, there's a crisis illustrated by this little map here, where in 1973, Lake Chad, which is one of the biggest uh, lakes that, over, that span over Nigeria, Niger, and Chad, uh, 30, 30 million people live off this area. This used to be an agricultural hub. It was a, a really core driver of the economy. It's lost 90% of the water. There's, it, it's all, it all evaporates. So to the, today, it's less than 10% of what it was just a few years ago, largely because of IMF and World Bank cash cropping that forces cotton production, which uses a lot of water, and no infrastructure. So there have been plans since the 80s by uh, the Italian firm Bonifica, which we pr- uh, the Schiller Institute promoted this uh, through hundreds of conferences to take excess water runoff from Congo, where there's many, many, many... Uh, rivers, which waste water, taking 5 to 7% of that water runoff from the Congo River Basin and shaping just a series of canals, which goes up, it's, it's ambitious, about 2,000 kilometers in length, would do it, it would, would be adequate to refill the lake while creating vast, vast watersheds. Bonifica uh, produced this quick animated overview just demonstrating the replenishing of the lake over the over the course of the coming 60 to 70 years to bring it back to full capacity. But it wouldn't just be the lake. You're creating a watershed of increased agriculture, and along the way, you're increasing massive hydroelectric power. Massive. It's the most abundant potential for hydroelectric power on this world. And it would simply be using the force of gravity to move this water, 5% of the the runoff, along this this path that would also open up ports, other things as well. Um, That would be revolutionary, and it would also tie in seven major countries together in a common project. Uh, very recently, China Power, as well as Italian, uh, the Italian government, and I believe it was Benefica itself, together uh, signed a memorandum of understanding with some starting capital by both China and by the Italian government to, fund, to begin funding this project. So it's actually, it's shovel ready, the project has begun. Most, have you, have, has anybody heard of this in the Western media? Oh, no, no, me neither. It's, there's a complete blackout on these things. Quick demonstration. If the New Silk Road programs, these rail, both high-speed and standard-gauge rail, were deployed, what's, uh, what's being discussed is, for the first time ever, a connection of rail, of, of rail uniting all of Africa. This is one of the, the graphs uh, in the report that Jason helped co-write um, on the World Land Bridge on the right, this would bo- both be regular, standard gauge, and eventually a transition towards high speed with magnetic levitation as a, as a focus. 
On the left is the type of rails that uh, imperialist countries have, have built in Africa, which if you look at them, they're all different gauges. There's about 12 different types of gauge of rails because they were constantly done by European imperialists over the centuries, well, over a century, to ensure that there would be no chance of Africa connecting one side to another. So they consciously coordinated building different gauges so that you couldn't get a cohesive African um, alliance. That would, be, that, would, that would finally change. Nicholas is going to go a lot more in detail into some of this. I'm just going to show two more uh, case studies here. One of which Nicholas is going to introduce. It's a beautiful idea. And this is, there's two big rail projects that were just done. The Addis Ababa Djibouti rail, rail line that connects to the Maritime Silk Road that was just completed. It's uh, almost 800 kilometers. It turned three days of travel into 12 hours. It was $4.5 billion, funded mostly from China, uh, completely revolutionary. Then we have what we see here, which is the Nairobi Mombasa Railway, uh, $3.2 billion just completed. And this is not the whole thing. This is just what's in purple. This is part of a multi-phase project called the East African Railway Master Plan, which uh, the next phases will begin to connect all of these other countries from Congo, South Sudan, Ethiopia, uh, Rwanda, Kenya. These projects are very, very important, and they tie into um, deep water ports in Cameroon that are being planned, Senegal. Um, there's ports all over the place that are being built up. The Lake Chad Basin, like I said, it involves also Cameroon. And the way that China is doing it, if, for people, again, who say that they're creating debt traps, for this last project, China not only paid 80% or 80% of it was supplied by a Chinese loan, but with a 10-year grace period and a 40-year payback period. 40 years to pay this thing back. This is not anything like the way that business is done by the World Bank. In 2008, Lyndon LaRouche gave a speech where he brought up Africa. And this is before the Belt and Road Initiative, but it was on the Four Power Alliance, the need to create. This is 2008. Um, people thought that the Four Power Alliance idea was the furthest thing from reality. But, and this is the idea of the United States, Russia, China, India, together representing with those four sovereign nation states working with a common orientation, a sufficient power to break the controls of the, of the financial oligarchy, which has tried to manipulate society now for far too long. So with such an alliance, there would be a sufficient power to break it. And he made the point in this long speech, it's a beautiful presentation, uh, but here's this component where he breaks into Africa, where he says, Africa is still a victim of the mass genocide by the British Empire, pure and simple. Cut away all the garbage, and that's it. It's the British Empire which is destroying Africa. So now we have a mission, not merely the problem of restoring economies of the United States and Europe and so forth. We have a problem of a world which is already suffering from shortages caused by this system, as in the case of China, progressing but not enough. India progressing, but 70% are, are extremely poor. Still, similar throughout Asia, Africa is a target of major genocide, chiefly by the British interests. Therefore, if we are going to deal with the world to come over the next two generations, which is about the period we have to think about, we have to think of a program for developing the planet within the context, not of globalization, but of a system of sovereign nation states. That means that nation states in particular regions of the world, in, oh, that nations in particular regions of the world have to come to common agreements on development, long range development so we can create a credit for up to a 50-year perspective for investment in infrastructure in such projects. For example, Africa cannot be developed without a modern equivalent of a rail system, which means largely a maglev system. That's magnetic levitation rail. Without, without development of power systems and mass transportation systems and water management, Africa cannot develop. The genocide will continue to proceed by inertia. Therefore, we have an African an Africa mission as part of the world.